Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today as we consider the President's fiscal year 2012 budget request for the Department of the Air Force. Secretary Donnelly, General Schwartz, it's good to have you back before the committee today. We appreciate all you do and we're truly grateful for both of you for your many years of service to our nation. Last year at this time, we talked a bit about your vision for the Air Force and specifically the need for a short-term fix-it sort of perspective. To a longer-term view, that seriously addresses national security risks in a very challenging global environment. At that time, I remarked that I believe the Air Force is at a critical juncture, one that will prove to be historic, and I caution that we must be wise in the path we chose. I stand by those remarks today. There is no doubt that we must take our nation's financial position into account and I appreciate the fact that Secretary Gates and the Department have identified savings from lower priority programs and efficiencies that can be reinvested into force structure and modernization. However, we must be cautious moving forward that we do not take short-term savings at the risk of our longer-term security. This year's budget request for the Air Force reflects a 2% reduction in real growth from the fiscal year 2011 budget request. The Air Force's operation and maintenance accounts, military construction accounts, and procurement accounts are all funded below the levels requested last year, despite inflation and despite rising fuel costs. This committee needs to clearly understand the risks associated with these reductions. I understand that the Air Force identified over $33 billion in efficiencies to support this budget but it's unclear to me how much of that funding was retained and reinvested in the future of the Air Force. I'm also very concerned that many of these efficiencies are cost avoidance initiatives and not clear-cut savings. And as such, they may not actually materialize. We've seen this from the Air Force before, the most recent examples being a 2006 attempt before your time to cut 40,000 personnel in order to fund procurement efforts. And then in the insourcing initiatives from that, the last budget cycle, neither of those worked out so well. We cannot and must not allow short-sighted budget drills to drive our national security priorities and planning. The Air Force can't continue business as usual. We must find cost savings through innovation and competition. Just last week, as an example, I was briefed on an innovative approach, a business model that could significantly reduce the cost of space launch. And I think you've been informed of that. We will talk about that. Echoing my remarks from yesterday's hearing, this Congress must finish work on defense appropriations legislation that was left unfinished in the 111th Congress. We've been working on that now all night the last few nights, and I guess we hear we're going to be working all night tonight, now and maybe tomorrow, given our promise that we were going to be done by 3 o'clock today. We had a, two promises that, a, that conflicted. One was openness and letting everybody participate. The other was a schedule. The schedule fell to the openness and letting everybody participate. So. Uh, with all the work we've done the last few nights, I'm told that there's more left to do than what we've already done. So, uh, you're going to miss that afternoon flag, <laughs> as we all are. Um, echoing my remarks from yesterday's hearing, uh, uh, as I just talked about, I'm very concerned about the implications to our troops of funding the Department of Defense at fiscal year 2010 funding levels in a year-long continuing resolution. One thing we all agree on, and that is that we, it would be devastating to the Defense Department, to our military, to the troops, to have a year-long CR. We definitely need, def desperately need to get this appropriations bill done for the military. Our men and women in uniform deserve more from this body. Gentlemen, I look forward to our discussion today and hearing more from you on your vision, your strategic goals, and your 2012 budget request. Ranking Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll start by agreeing with you on, on 
two critical points. Number one, the need to get a defense appropriations bill this, this year and not rely on a CR. I've heard from all the services as well as you know, many contractors who are you know, in limbo on a number of different very important products um, and a number of important programs, sorry, if we don't get that done. So we're hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll do that. Uh, hopefully we'll do it sooner rather than later, but uh, one way or the other we will move through the process and get that done. And also I want to agree with the chairman that as we look at the budget constraints that we face with our overall budget and within the Department of Defense as well, that we make sure not to jeopardize our national security needs and priorities as we do that. Now, just as uh, Mr. McKeon alluded to, the, the promise of, you know, we'll get you out of here on three and we'll have a completely open process, occasionally those promises do conflict, and, and making sure that we meet all of our requirements within the tight budget environment that we have is, is not going to be easy. Uh, but I do believe, based on the testimony from Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullen yesterday, uh, that both of them and all of you are doing a very good job of doing that in an efficient and responsible way. I think the initial take, finding you know $178 billion uh, in efficiencies. Now, as Secretary Gates said yesterday, the great quote, he said, the, the out years are when everybody's dreams come true. Um, to some degree, that applies even directly to the $178 billion figure that he gave us. So there's going to be more work required, but I honestly believe that all of the services and the Secretary have really gone in and scrubbed the budget. And they're looking for places where we can find efficiencies, get more out of the money we're spending, rethink our requirements and what we truly need to get the job done. So I applaud you for that effort. And I know in the Air Force it's, it's particularly challenging because you have significant uh, programmatic upgrades that are being required. You know, the tanker contract, uh, which we are all hopeful after a long and tortured history, um, we'll get that going and get it done. I know General Schwartz, Secretary Donnelly, you have worked very, very hard to make that happen, and we appreciate that. Um, Joint Strike Fighter, of course, is a huge program for the Air Force uh, going forward. It needs to get straightened out. Um, the expanding number of UAVs and other ISR platforms, there, there's a lot that you need to get done in order to, to meet the requirements that we're asking of you, and you're working on it and doing a good job. And then also the, the personnel, um, as many may not be aware, I mean, starting back in 1990 with the Desert uh, Shield program, the Air Force has actually been more or less at war for over 20 years now, and that's placed an incredible strain on the force and the equipment, and we need to make sure that we're protecting our airmen and their families as, as we go forward on that. Um, with that, I look forward to your testimony. I want to thank both General uh, Schwartz and Secretary Donnelly for their outstanding leadership in the Air Force. I look forward to your testimony and your answers to our questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have with us today the Honorable Michael B. Donnelly, Secretary of the Air Force, and General Norton A. Schwartz, Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force. Gentlemen, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman McKinn, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee, it is a pleasure to be here today representing more than 690,000 active duty, guard, reserve, and civilian airmen. I'm also honored to be joined today by my teammate and a tireless public service, uh, public servant, our Chief of Staff, General Norty Schwartz. I'd first like to recognize the unfortunate absence of Congresswoman Giffords today. The Air Force knows and respects Representative Giffords for her strong support of our men and women in uniform, and especially for the airmen who serve at davis monthan Air Force Base and live in the Tucson community. We certainly wish her a speedy recovery and look forward to her return to this committee. Today I'm pleased to report that America's Air Force continues to provide the nation unmatched global vigilance, reach and power as part of the joint team with an uncompromising commitment to our core values of integrity, service before self, and excellence in all we do. The Air Force is requesting $150 billion in our baseline budget and $16 billion in the Overseas Contingency Operations Supplemental Appropriation to support this work. Our budget request re represents a careful balance of resources among the Air Force core functions necessary to implement the President's national security strategy and between today's operations and investment for the future. Before discussing our FY12 budget request, I'd like to address some unfinished business from fiscal year 11 and also set in context the changes in your Air Force over the past several years. 
As you alluded to, Mr. Chairman, operating without a defense appropriations bill in FY11 is having a significant impact on the Air Force. A decision to extend the continuing resolution at FY10 levels through the remainder of this year would delay our ability to reach the Secretary of Defense's directed goal of 65 MQ-1 or 9 uh, combat air patrols by 2013 in support of current operations in Afghanistan. It would cause a production break and a likely increase in the unit cost of the wideband global communications satellite, the joint air-to-surface standoff missile, F-15 radar modernization, and other programs. Deeper reductions to our modernization programs would be required to fund over $3 billion in must-pay bills for urgent operational needs in Afghanistan and Iraq, for military health care, and the military pay raise of 1.4 percent, which Congress authorized but is not funded. Without FY11 appropriations, we face delay or cancellation of some depot maintenance, weapon system sustainment, and other day-to-day -day activities in order to prioritize our most critical needs under the lower funding levels in a full-year CR. Finally, FY11 appropriations are also required for 75 military construction projects now on hold, which support ongoing operational needs and improve the quality of life for airmen and their families. Passing an FY11 defense appropriation bill is essential to avoid these severe disruptions, and we appreciate the efforts that are currently underway to resolve this situation. Over the past decade, the Air Force has substantially reshaped itself to meet the immediate needs of today's conflicts and position itself for the future. While we have grown in some critical areas, it has been at the expense of others. We've added intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capacity with 328 remotely piloted aircraft and over 6,000 airmen to collect, process, exploit, and disseminate intelligence. We've added over 17 aircraft and nearly 2,400 airmen to bolster special operations capacity so necessary in counterinsurgency. We've added over 160 F-22s and 120 C-17s to our inventory and funded over 30 satellites and added 2,200 airmen for critical nuclear and cyber operations and acquisition support. In the same period, however, we retired over 1,500 legacy aircraft. We've canceled or truncated procurement of major acquisition programs, shed manpower in career fields less critical to the fight, and deferred much needed military construction in order to balance these capabilities within the resources available. In all, during the past seven years, the size of the active duty Air Force has been reduced from 359,000 in 2004 to approximately 333,000 today. And the Air Force's baseline budget, when adjusted for inflation and setting aside the annual wartime supplemental appropriations has remained flat. Looking ahead, we face mu a multi-year effort to recapitalize our aging tanker, fighter, bomber, and missile forces, to continue modernizing critical satellite constellations, meet dynamic requirements in the cyber domain, and replace aging airframes for pilot training and presidential support. We continue to recognize the requirement for fiscal, fiscal restraint and are committed to remaining good stewards of every taxpayer dollar, improving management and oversight at every opportunity. The FY12 budget request incorporates over $33 billion in efficiencies across the future year defense plan, which will be shifted to higher priority combat capability by reducing overhead costs improving business practices and eliminating excess, troubled, or lower priority programs. By consolidating organizational structures, improving processes in acquisition, in procurement, logistic support, and streamlining operations, 
We have been able to increase investment in core functions such as global precision attack, integrated ISR, space, and air superiority, reducing risk by adding tooth through savings in tail. We are fully committed to implementing these planned efficiencies and have already assigned responsibilities to senior officials and put in place the management structure to oversee this work and track progress on a regular basis. Having faced the need to reshape our force structure and capabilities within constrained manpower and resources over the past several years, we do not view the current need for efficiencies as a singular event, but as an essential and continuing element of prudent management in the Air Force. Our investment priorities remain consistent with minimizing risk and maximizing effectiveness and efficiency across the full spectrum of potential conflict. Proceeding with the new KCX tanker aircraft, implementing the Joint Strike Fighter restructure, meeting the combatant commander's need for more ISR, investing in the long-range strike family of systems, including a new penetrating bomber, and enhancing space control and situational awareness all remain critical capabilities both for today's and for tomorrow's Air Force. In addition to these investments, we'll continue to address challenges in readiness, in particular the slow but persistent decline in materiel readiness, most notable, mo notable in our non-deployed forces, and the personnel challenges across 28 stressed officer and enlisted career fields both of which are the result of today's high operational tempo. And of course, we'll continue to support our active guard and reserve airmen and their families with quality housing, health care, schools, and community support. With respect to health care, I would like to convey the Air Force's support for DOD's TRICARE reforms that will modestly increase premiums for working age retirees premiums that have not changed since they were initially set in 1995. Going forward, we must continue to seek and develop reforms in the benefits that our men and women in uniform earn to make them economically sustainable over the long term. Mr. Chairman, good stewardship of the United States Air Force is a responsibility that General Schwartz and I take very seriously, and we remain grateful for the continued support and service of this committee, and we look forward to discussing our proposed budget. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Smith, and members of the committee, it's a privilege to be here today with Secretary Donnelly representing the men and, and women of the United States Air Force. Congressman Woman Gifford's absence saddens us today, but her spirit compels us to continue our work. And our airmen continue to inspire us with their dedication uh, and service and impress us with their many accomplishments. Quietly and proudly serving alongside their Army, Navy, Marine, and Coast Guard teammates, airmen every day act on behalf of the American people as stewards of the nation's trust and defenders of her security. This budget requests fully appreciating the extraordinary fiscal condition that our nation faces, supports our airmen and continuing efforts to structure the force for maximum versatility across the full spectrum of operations for today's requirements and tomorrow's challenges. Because of budgetary pressures, I echo Secretary Donnelly's concerns about operating under a continuing resolution and extending far beyond March 4th without a 2011 appropriations bill, we will have to reduce flying hours, delay or cancel some weapon system sustainment and depot maintenance activity, and disrupt other day-to-day -day operations, all of which will adversely affect readiness and impact our brave men and women who are preparing to serve or are serving in harm's way. Consistent with the 2010 National Security Strategy and the Quadrennial Defense Review, and our, our national military objectives are to counter violent extremism, defeat 
uh, and deter aggression, strengthen international and regional security, and shape the future force. Airmen are committed to the task of leveraging air and space power with all of its inherent versatility and presenting to the president and our national leadership a range of strategic options to meet those objectives, even while the nation continues to grapple with substantial deficits in related national debt. To counter violent extremism, airmen continue to make vital contributions to our nation's strategic objective of disrupting, dismantling, and defeating al-Qaeda and its affiliates in Afghanistan and elsewhere, thereby inhibiting their return to former sanctuaries. More than 30,000, 7,000 airmen, approximately 6% of the force are four deployed worldwide. Of this group, nearly 30,000 are continuing on a rotating basis to contribute to operations in the United States Central Command area of responsibility, including 10,000 airmen in Afghanistan providing close air support to U.S. and coalition ground forces, airlift and air refueling, personnel rescue and aeromedical evacuation from hostile battle space, and training and exercises to develop our partner air force. An additional 50, 57,000 total force airmen, or about 11% of our force, are forward stationed overseas providing capabilities and direct support of our combatant commander requirements. And from home stations here in the United States, approximately 218,000 airmen, or 43% of the force, provide daily support to worldwide operations, standing nuclear alert, commanding and controlling our satellites, analyzing intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance data, and much, much more. To deter and defeat aggression, we maintain vigilance across the entire spectrum of conflict while we employ multi-role systems with capabilities that can flex to different warfighting requirements. At the upper end of the continuum, we continue to provide two of the nation's three arms of nuclear deterrence with steadfast excellence, precision, and reliability. And across the remainder of the operational spectrum, we will continue to leverage air and space power capabilities that are vital to the nation's ability to sustain a robust conventional deterrent. This requires the ability to rapidly project power through the global commons and globally interconnected domains of air, space, and cyberspace. Therefore, in addition to leveraging air power, we will also magnify our efforts to reinforce our cadre of space and cyber professionals. We will continue to ensure precision navigation and timing, secured satellite communications, timely missile warning, and global environmental, environmental sensing for our joint teammates. While we enhance our space situation awareness that is vital to attributing space-borne threats and protect, protecting our systems and capabilities. We will also continue to support the whole of nation efforts to team with international partners in reinforcing norms for space and cyber activities, and ultimately, developing a broader range of options to ensure our nation's access to and freedom of action in both domains. To strengthen international and regional security, the Air Force will translate Air Power's inherent ability to tra traverse vast distances with unmatched speed, ensuring that U.S. forces are globally available, yet through inherent versatility can be tailored and scaled to be regionally focused through a whole of nation approach and with mutually supporting strategies toward this objective. The U.S. Air Force and the Joint Team will underwrite defense, diplomatic, and developmental efforts to help address the root causes of radicalism and aggression and not just their violent manifestations. For instance, nearly 300 airmen are deployed as members of the Iraq Training and Advisory Mission, supporting the development of counterpart capabilities in over 400 specialties. Similarly, our 
airmen supporting the combined air power transition force not only advise Afghan airmen, they help to set the conditions for a viable and self-sustaining Afghan Army Air Force to meet a range of security requirements. Ultimately, these and other coordinated efforts to build international partner capacities can help to prevent lower intensity problems from escalating into full-scale crises. Finally, to shape the future force, we will work to ensure readiness, training, and equipage while contending with serious budgetary pressures. Our systems and capabilities must be ever more adaptable to be employed across the full range of operation, while agile command and control capabilities and shared interoperability with our joint and coalition partners. But flexible air, space, and cyber capabilities require resilient airmen. They are the lifeblood of our Air Force to whom we owe our fullest commitment, particularly our wounded warriors and their families. And during this time of sustained and frequent deployments, we will bolster our capacity to provide assistance to our airmen in managing both the obvious and the less obvious challenges of returning home from war. Since the 1st of July 2010, we've made considerable progress in this regard with the establishment of the Deployment Transition Center at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, where nearly 1,200 personnel attended programs to decompress and begin a healthy reintegration into family and unit of assignment. We intend to continue this progress. And as deployment tempos remain high, we will further strengthen our efforts to develop core components of the Air Force Resiliency Program and its ongoing assessment of the fitness of our force. This will inform our efforts as we continue to improve quality of airmen and family services and support from child education to base fitness centers to transition assistance programs. In closing, I'd also, Mr. Chairman, like to affirm my personal support for the efforts to better control DOD health care costs. I respect and I celebrate the service and sacrifice of our retirees. They are, and they always will be, honored members of the Air Force family. But I do believe that the current proposals are both modest and responsible. Mr. Chairman and committee members, the Air Force remains steadfastly committed to providing global vigilance, reach, and power for America. Thank you for your continued support of the United States, Airmen, uh, the United States Air Force for our airmen and, of course, for our families. I look forward to your questions, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, you both talked about um, <clears throat> the importance of an appropriation bill that would fund the Department of Defense for the rest of this year. We find ourselves in a in a awkward situation not having done the work last year and so now we're trying to finish it up and at the same time start our work for this year. Um, we're five months into the year. We have on the floor right now a CR which contains um, a cut of $16 billion over the request for this year, which leaves about uh, $2 billion more than was spent in fiscal year 10. The uh, Secretary was here yesterday and reaffirmed his strong position for the one engine for the F-35, and he was successful, a vote on the floor last night, um, eliminated the uh, second engine. In so doing, the amendment that was passed takes the $450 million and takes it out of the defense budget, puts it into uh, payment against the debt. So that $2 billion is now about $1.5 billion. And we also have other amendments on the floor today that will be proposing further cuts in defense. The problem, as I see it, as we start our work for next year, not having done the work last year, is where do you, where do you see yourself starting? You've presented a budget 
and we don't really have a starting number because we don't know what, where we're going to be. It could actually even be less than was spent last year. So when you talk about the things we did in the authorization bill uh, at the end of last year that gave a raise to our troops, I don't know if you have that in, in your budget, but it, it, it would put us in a, real, in a real quandary, I'm sure, as we move forward along with many of the other things that you've mentioned. The um, $33.3 billion in savings from efficiencies, I have a couple of questions on. First of all, how do you intend to track the realization? Now, those were over five years, so it's not all in this, in this budget that you're proposing, but I'd like to know how you intend to track the realization of those savings and what you expect to spend those savings on that gives us modernization and, and does a better job for us than the things that you've realized in the savings. If you could respond to those, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to uh, one of the f initial comments you uh, uh, made concerning the pay raise, the FY12 budget assumes a 1.6 a pay raise for military personnel. There is no pay raise assumed for civilians uh, for FY12 or FY13 in the president's budget. So that, that is the status of our uh, pay, pay proposals. Uh, to the subject of efficiencies, yes, we, as I indicated, we did propose uh, and get approved uh, $33 billion in savings across the future year's defense program. For the Air Force, those were broken up into about 12 different categories of, of activities, uh, ranging from uh, energy, uh, IT consolidation, uh, uh, consolidation of uh, headquarters, uh, infrastructure, uh, and acquisition changes in our acquisition process going forward. Those were not um, uh, cost avoidance kinds of assumptions. Those dollars were assumed in our out, out year program and were tracked in particular accounts. So we, we can track uh, where we are against that uh, database. So for each of those 12 areas, we've identified a, a senior uh, officer or uh, SES, a civilian, to be the champion for that work. Uh, they have all come in with initial plans for how they intend to achieve those savings across the future year plan. We had lots of discussion on these matters before settling on the targets and the categories. So I think we've had several months of work on this uh, now under our belt, and we have, uh, we have champions for each of those 12 categories, and we have an oversight process which will bring them back to our Air Force Council on a regular basis to, to report uh, progress. Uh, just on the flip side, uh, we have been able to uh, uh, fully fund and normalize funding for the EELV, the uh, Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle family of launchers, um, which had been underfunded, uh, and we have put over $3 billion against that uh, in the FIDIP. Uh, we've been able to start work on a new penetrating bomber, uh, we've put dollars in to enhance F-15 uh, radars, uh, and, and we've made a number of other uh, proposals as, as well. Chief, would you? I, I would just mention one more, sir, to give you a sense of, of how we're also trying to normalize the contingency accounts versus the base budget in that we brought the MC-12 operational costs that's uh, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Light Aircraft, uh, from the contingency account into the base budget. And so that was enabled through these efficiencies. And that's real capability that will stay with us uh, and should stay with us rather than perhaps uh, retiring at, at, the, uh, at the conclusion of the current engagements. Let me, let me um, <clears throat> thank you for, for that. Let me just ask a question. If, if we had gotten our work done last year by 
let's say if we had gotten it done before the year end of September 30th, you had a, a, a uh, you had money that would have been in there for uh, a pay increase for last October 1st to the coming September 30th. If in fact we end up with what's on the floor today and there are no further changes and it ends up at 500 and 33 and a half billion, something like that, which is, which is considerably under what your request was for this year that would have been done last year. What does that do to the raise that we had voted for the troops for the year that we're halfway through? Well, sir, the, the current picture that I, I think I've painted, but I would like to, to make sure that you understand is that we have, we have broken acquisition programs as a result of uh, staying at an FY10 level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I articulated the particular programs right. that have been affected by the extension of a CR. But we also have bills to pay on the operations side, healthcare bills to pay. Our, the pay raise is being, the 1.4% approved by Congress last year, is being paid out. Uh, to our starting uh, last October. Starting last October, it simply means that our personnel account, the last payroll of this fiscal year, is uncovered. So we cannot make payroll for the last uh, 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 pay period this fiscal year. It, and because we have those operational costs in front of us that are must-pay bills, we will dig further into our modernization accounts we will break programs further to get the resources reallocated toward the must-pay operational bills. That is our site picture if we had to extend uh, a full year CR at FY10 levels. And that extends across all the services. So there's jeopardy about how they're going to be paid at the end of the year. That's correct. We would. <clears throat> One, one thing I'd like to offer for your consideration, um, the lower the number is for FY10, the, the more flexibility the department needs uh, to move funding across accounts because we have to make some massive adjustments in our budget mid-year. So we would need uh, special consideration to do that. We, so, think th we think the better approach is to fund what's required for FY11. Right. But uh, if, it, if, if that is not feasible for some reason, but if, we've got to have flexibility to cover these and, costs. And if someone is assuming that, that these cuts that we're talking about won't affect the troops, they're, they're probably mistaken. Absolutely. If, if you would consider uh, not getting your pay raise affecting the troops. Well, we, we would have to make significant uh, changes in our budget in order to make sure that last pay period is covered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. I have um, two sets of questions, actually. I am working with Congresswoman Gifford's staff to make sure that her questions and concerns are addressed during the hearing and doing that myself. So I have some for her district and then uh, couple on broader issues as well. And as you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, Davis Monthan Air Force Base is in her district. Her staff and her notes that they gave to me said that she always refers to it as the best Air Force Base in the nation. I'm in a bit of an uncomfortable spot to say that, uh, seeing as how uh, McCord Air Force Base is in my district and pretty good. I guess technically it's a joint base now. So uh, best joint base, best Air Force Base. But that's uh, Congressman Gifford's uh, opinion at any rate. Um, and it is a great place. I'm going to have the opportunity to go down there and visit it at the end of March. Um, and the one question she had uh, about the base, there is a consolidation of the Air and Space Operations Centers. Uh, the 612th is at davis Month, and the 601st is in Florida. I um, just wanted to know what the process was going to be for that consolidation and also what impacts that might have on uh, the Air Force's uh, Southern Command's capabilities in this area. Um, I'll take a quick comment on that, and then also if you could submit something to her, to her office for the record, that'd be great too. Uh, General? Uh, Congressman, we'd be happy to do that. Um, just quickly, this is one of the efficiencies that, that gained us the 33 plus billion in, in savings we identified earlier. And the fundamental logic of this was that our air 
operations center, we had one line for each of the 10 combatant commands. And, and that's the right alignment, but it turned, it, the reality was is that we were never able to man those centers to 100%. Right. Um, and, and as we looked at this, we had to ask ourselves, are there ways to, to be more efficient to economize? And there were two locations that, that came to mind. One was in Europe, where the 617th supports AFRICOM, and the 603rd supports UCOM, and they are essentially at the same location, but now separate. Yeah. And it made clear sense to consolidate there. Likewise, in domestically, there, as you're well aware, uh, during the Haiti operation, it, it was the 601st uh, AOC that actually did most of the work for S Southern Command during the Haiti contingency. And that certainly raised the specter in our own minds, might it be possible to consolidate those two missions in a way that would serve both NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM? We think that that is the case. We have a strategic basing process, sir, that we will go through, establish criteria, objective criteria, and, and evaluate both Davis, Monson, and Tyndall, the current locations of both of those air, uh, air operations center for which is the best location to consolidate. And, uh, and that decision will be taken uh, later this spring or early summer. Right. Thank you. And the only other area um, for Congresswoman Giffords is on energy. That's been a major focus of hers. Um, the largest consumer of energy in the United States is uh, the Department of Defense, so anything we can save there is great. Obviously, the Air Force uh, fuel is a major, major issue, and I know you have launched a number of efficiencies and alternatives programs. Can you give us some idea of the savings that you envision being able to do in that area? Sir, uh, uh, sir we've, uh, in, in part of our efficiencies and savings package, we've assumed about uh, $700 million in savings across the future year defense program we have how is that achieved just quickly what are the the big programs that drive the savings uh, there are a number of pieces to it uh, some of it is uh, investing in energy projects which will make uh, help us uh, manage our energy energy assets uh, more carefully more closely uh, it involves uh, bringing into the flying units especially the large aircraft operated by uh, air mobility uh, 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 Air Force uh, Mobility Command, the um, uh, more efficiency and flight profiles by bringing in commercial best practices that are used in commercial airliners today, uh, more aid, uh, better aids to navigation, those sorts of, of issues that, that will improve flight profiles. It also involves uh, investing in renewables. We have, right. we have about 400 projects across the Air Force that are working on energy efficiency a little over 50 of those are focused on renewable sources of energy, and certainly in the Southwest, solar is is big. Uh, it also involves uh, in investing in uh, our in in early demolition of aging infrastructure that we don't need, so we can get it off our books and take take away future bills by eliminating uh, excess buildings, for example. Those are, those are the highlights. Okay. And I think it's also important to point out the technology on alternative fuels is getting to the point where you can fly even in very complicated, very sophisticated Air Force airplanes with alternative fuels. Now, there's a scale problem. Now, you have to make sure you have enough of it to be sustainable, but there's, there's great promise, I think, in those areas. Thank you. And I just have a, a couple questions of, of my own. Um, General Schwartz, you had a, a fairly colorful way recently of describing the uh, difficulties in our Air Force acquisition program. I won't repeat that here in public. Um, but I will say that I completely agree with the sentiment that we've had a major, major problem in a variety of different areas of going for too much in our acquisition programs, and that certainly hasn't been peculiar to the Air Force. Uh, it has happened across the services, but it's cost us an enormous amount of money and left us with not as much to show for it as, as it should have. Um, one particular area in space, you know, we've had a major challenge on that in terms of figuring out what the right mix of satellites is and launch vehicles. Um, but broadly speaking, can you elaborate a little bit? Because I think it's a critical point. If we're going to save money, get the best equipment to our troops, um, we're going to have to be smarter about how we do this. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit on wh what you see there? 
Sir, there's a couple of areas where there's real promise. The way we buy satellites today is one at a time. Uh, and, and just to meet the need. So, you know, just in time delivery of satellites means that you build one, you wait four or five years, you build another, and so on. And it, and it entails um, not only stop start of workforce, but non recurring engineering and, and all expenses that are associated with, with not having a continuous workload. And so one of our efforts, which we intend to undertake, is, is an, an effort both with AEHF, the Advanced Communication Satellite, and CIBRS, that is the Early Warning Satellite, to suggest that we will build satellites in blocks, more than one, to get up the learning curve, to earn the efficiencies that that brings along with it. Uh, and likewise, on the launch side, instead of buying two this year and eight the next year, to suggest that, that we will try to stabilize that as well, and to do this across the government, not just DOD, but DOD, the NRO, and NASA together, instead of competing against ourselves, will we'll go to the, to the providers for these services together. Uh, these are the kinds of efforts that we think will, will yield uh, efficiencies. It will need your support, sir, because there are, particularly on the satellite side, there will be a need for traditional appropriation, some advanced appropriation, um, and, and so on. And so we, we will have to, um, to well, we'll discuss be, that with We'll you. be very, very happy to support that, and I think that's a critical issue across the DOD. Um, essentially, you know, the best way it was ever put to me is when I was serving on the Intel Committee and we we're talking about satellites. You, know, you can sort of imagine what you want. So it's like, well, we'll build this one. Then next time it'll be, we'll be able to do all this other stuff. And then someone said, you know, a, a computer model will build, will, will beat an actual uh, piece of equipment every day of the week. But it's just a computer model. It's a vision off in the future um, that may or may not come to pass and may or may not be what we need. So I, I applaud you on that. Um, Two final things. One, I'll just take for the record. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how the joint basing arrangement is going. I think it's working great out at uh, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Uh, you've got you know two colonels out there, um, you know Army, uh, Air Force, who are working very closely together, doing a great job. But I'm curious if you just submit for the record when you get a chance, you know what we could do to make that work better. I think it is a, a very positive step uh, in the right direction. And then just a quick comment on uh, the J Stars upgrade, Joint Stars upgrade program. This is an ISR platform based off of a 707 airframe now, uh, and you're looking at ways to upgrade that capability. Sort of two ways to go. One is just figure out a way to make the 707s that you have work better. Uh, two would be to update the platform to the 737. Um, curious what you think is the best approach and when you're gonna make a decision on that. Sir, there are, there are a couple of options. Uh, we currently have direction, both uh, from uh, within the department and, and in in language to pursue a re-engineering effort for the E8 J Stars platform, and uh, in subject to appropriations, we'll be acquiring uh, up to four ship sets um, to to accomplish both test and validation of of that uh, modification to give us information on what what a re-engineering effort on on the E8 would mean for the long-term future. We have an analysis of alternatives underway, which will conclude this late this spring, which is not just looking at re-engineering the J-STARS and perhaps improving the, the uh, radar that's, that's inherent in that platform, but as you suggested, the P-8 is an option, the Navy airplane, and there are others, the Block 40 Global Hawk. Is, is a possibility. Likewise, there are business class jet applications that are also a possibility. And so this study is looking at those to dis discern, you know, what's the best blend um, to, to uh, deal with the, the ground moving target indicator mission, the GMTI mission. mission. That's where Th we're at, sir. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you very much, both of you, for your service. General Schwartz, as you know, in 1979, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force wrote Congress asking 
the Congress to support funding for the alternate engine for the F-35. Why did the Chief of Staff feel a need to ask for funding over and above the President's budget that year for funding for an alternate engine? Sir, I'll tell you my view of the alternate engine. It, it begins by stating that this is not 1979. The reality is, is that engines have matured considerably, both in terms of design, in terms of manufacture, in terms of material, in terms of durability, and so on, and reliability. Um, my, my view is, is simply this, that competition in, in the ideal is desirable. I, I agree with you, sir. Having said that, sir, I would like to uh, put a, a, a little chart up on the screen. I believe that your staff had that yesterday. I hope that uh, it has been shown to you. You can look on the screen and see it. Uh, last year, the Air Force provided a graphic to the committee based on a committee request for information on the Air Force experience with a primary and alternate engine for the F-16. Uh, how would you interpret the F-16 major accident trends for both the primary and alternate engines? Again, the F-100 engine was, in, in the early days, was an immature platform. And I, my, my point here is, is that the engines we are using today are, are much more mature, much more reliable, as we have demonstrated in the F-A-18, in the F-22, um, and, you know, certainly in the big airplanes. But, but in terms of the high-performance engines, you, as you note on, on your chart, sir, that, that the loss rate due to engine um, malfunctions has declined precipitously over the last 30 years. That is a factor in our recommendation not to pursue an alternate engine. But, sir, for these two engines, I know that it's just a positive correlation, which does not necessarily mean a cause and effect relationship, but there certainly is a positive correlation between the introduction of the alternate engine and the drastic reduction of the, of, of, of the mishap rate. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last year the GAO provided the committee with a graphic on its analysis of the average procurement unit cost per engine for both engines for the F-16. The F-16 primary and alternate engine manufacturers began competing uh, in the mid-80s. How would you describe price trends before and after the introduction of the alternate engine for the F-16? And I think that's charts up on the screen for you, too. Mr. Bartlett, I'd like to look at this more closely and give you an answer for the record. Well, sir, as you look at the chart, it's pretty obvious that the price came down. As a matter of fact, the GAO indicated in its 2007 report in the alternate engine that prices for the F-16 engine decreased by an average of 21 percent over the four years they analyzed. Again, sir, this is just a positive correlation. It does not necessarily mean a cause and effect relationship. But if you have enough of these circumstantial evidences, positive correlations, you begin to get a picture of that. Uh, I have one more uh, brief question. Um, Secretary Donnelly, in 2009, the Secretary of Defense canceled the Caesar X combat search and air rescue program, stating that the department was conducting a review of DOD-wide assets that could conduct uh, this mission. At that time, the Caesar X was the number two Air Force acquisition priority. What's the status of this review, and does the Air Force plan on restarting the Caesar X program? Uh, we're currently looking at uh, the requirements for uh, a future CSAR platform uh, in conjunction with the HH-60 uh, loss replacement program that's been underway uh, during the current conflicts, and also the replacement of other UH-1 of UH-1 capabilities across the Air Force, in particular in support of the uh, missile fields and the, and the nuclear mission, um, and a few other UH-1 uh, units across the Air Force. Uh, our goal is to see if we can get those requirements aligned so that we can get a cost-effective uh, uh, solution to our vertical lift challenge in all of those areas. But I, I think the Chief can amplify a little bit for you. Sir, the our goal here is to 
approach this as a minimally developmental effort. In other words, to secure a vertical lift capability that, that is largely off the shelf that we could modify to do, do both the combat rescue mission, rescue hoist, so on and so forth, uh, as well as the, the nuclear site support mission, which, which would need fewer modifications. Fundamentally, though, the approach, as opposed to CSRX, which was a highly developmental effort, we're looking at being less ambitious and approaching this as a minimally developmental effort. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Reyes, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for being here with us. The, uh, just two weeks ago, uh, I was with the chairman and another member of the committee in Afghanistan. We actually got an opportunity to fly the, uh, the Osprey, which is the equivalent of the CV-22 uh, for, the, for the Air Force. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity to ask uh, some of the crew members how it was going, how it was flying, what their thoughts were, and they seemed to love it. They seemed to think that it was performing well, that uh, uh, it gives uh, the Marines capabilities that, that they don't have uh, or they didn't have with a CH-46. And uh, uh, since the Air Force Special Operations Command has the uh, uh, CV-22, I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, in spite of the crash that occurred in Afghanistan where we unfortunately lost four crew members, curious to know your assessment uh, of the, uh, the CV-22 and if you have any uh, uh, information as to the operations that are ongoing in, in Afghanistan, that would probably be very useful for us. Congressman, uh, the, the, the airplane does things that a conventional helicopter could never imagine doing, and I have some experience in this area. The, it, it, in our case, it succeeded the MH-53J Pavehawk helicopter, or Pavelo helicopter, I'm sorry, uh, a, a very good machine in its own right, but, but what this combines is the capacity to go vertical in tight spaces as well as, is, um, is have a block speed that's, that's like a turboprop. And so you can get to locations quickly and operate in the vertical dimension, which is not unlike any other platform that, that we've ever operated. It, it is performing well, we, and, and there is great confidence, not just by the air crews, sir, but also by the shooters, by, by the, the people who get to the target um, via this mode of transportation. The only thing I would mention is that we have experienced greater than expected wear on engines. Um, in part, this is due to the environment in Afghanistan. In part, it's because we think we need a, a, a particle separator apparatus on the airplane. Um, but the bottom line is we're working the engine issues with both Rolls, who's the manufacturer, and, and Boeing, who's the prime, and, uh, and we'll fix that in time. Are, are, is there a, uh, a process in place that that gives uh, feedback in terms of uh, uh, perhaps some of the concerns that some members uh, of Congress, and, and I ask this because we just had a vote on this uh, a couple of days ago, and members are, qu are asking questions about uh, uh, the operation of the aircraft, the feasibility, and that. So I'm curious to know if there is a way that you can provide the crews and the uh, feedback from those involved in the operation of this aircraft uh, to us. Sir, we'd be happy to gather the sort of anecdotal um, testimony, if you will, from, from the operators and maintainers, and we'll put that together for you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I was, I was uh, referring to the, to the Osprey that we flew in in Afghanistan. We talked to the crews and seemed to be performing up to the expectations, but I think in lieu of that vote that we took earlier, I think it'd be 
beneficial to get uh, uh, some feedback for members of Congress that they could that they could see. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, next week, perhaps, we're going to get an announcement on the tanker, the long overdue tanker. Uh, but I've also heard the rumor that um, the Air Force has decided to issue, or the DOD has decided to issue, a stop work order immediately after the announcement because of an anticipated protest from whoever loses. Please tell me that's not so. Sir, we have uh, resources available to put against uh, the engineering and manufacturing development contract that will go with uh, the source selection on the tanker. And we will modulate the funding for that uh, based on where we are in the process. There's going to be no stop work order for issued then? We're going to modulate the funding for EMD based on where we are in the process. We will be just days after uh, this source selection uh, process and just days into a signature of a contract, so uh, there's going to be no appreciable effect on the ramp, if you will, in the day, immediate days after after uh, the decision. Okay, I just know that uh, I'm sure you have a full appreciation of the fact that everybody on this committee wants to see that tanker start being built. Uh, talking about the best Air Force base in America, Maxwell, uh, <coughs> the I'm sorry, I was mistaken. It's the best Air Force in the world. <laughs> uh, I, are you aware of the dorm problems they're having there for the visiting students that are just grossly under available? Um, and in some of the dorms that we've got, they're pretty antiquated. I know that everybody in a blue uniform in here has been to Maxwell, uh, if they're an officer, uh, so you're probably familiar with what I'm talking about. I, I have seen the dorms at Maxwell, not aware of, a, of the Shortage. current problem, but we do have uh, a dormitory master plan across the Air Force that has tiered the requirements and the sequence of our investments for, for dormitories. Good. I'm sure uh, it is in that mix. I, I, hope, I hope you will. I, I know you don't, you've got a lot of things to do, but if you could visit that plan and just look and see if, if you do have something uh, in the near future to address the shortage that we've got at Maxwell, I'd appreciate it, and then just have one of your staffers let me know, uh, like what out year you see that target being hit. And then lastly, uh, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, your future planning for professional military education efforts, specifically at Air University in Montgomery? So we uh, certainly don't anticipate any change. I mean, as you're well aware, we have everything from Air and Space Basic to Squadron Officer School to Air Command and Staff to Air War College, the School of Advanced Aerospace Studies. I mean, it is, it, you know, I didn't end up going there because I didn't qualify, but it is the intellectual capital of the Air Force. <laughs> um, that, that those courses are essential. And we also right. do more near-term activity there, including wing commander courses, group commander courses, preparing people to lead. So, uh, Congressman, uh, there's, there will be, there's no, no expectation of altering the, uh, the footprint of of education and training activity at Maxwell. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, again for being before us. Um, space is uh, increasingly congested, competitive, contested, and the level of funding for the space situational awareness or SSA as we all know it, is 27% lower um, than the fiscal year 11 request level. And it's also lower than the fiscal year 10 request. So my questions to you are, does this reflect a decrease in our focus on SSA? And how do the recent agreements with um, France and Australia support progress 
on SSA. Well, Ms. Sanchez, uh, uh, space situational aware awareness is a foundation uh, in the space domain, and it is a uh, mission of growing importance, uh, not just to the Air Force, but to the joint community as well as we turn our attention to this domain as you described the words out of the National Security Space Strategy. Uh, immediate funding for space situational awareness was, fun was uh, impacted by a programmatic decision that we made this year not to proceed with SBSS number two. Uh, we had a uh, launch of SBSS one last year. Uh, it has been successful, but the, but the uh, cost and the capability that we intended to get from uh, uh, SBSS two did not, did not match in our view. Uh, so we, uh, we canceled that uh, uh, SBSS two uh, we're now in the process of evaluating what comes after and seeing if we can develop more cost-effective uh, solutions uh, going forward. Uh, so that was really the main driver in, S in the change in SSA funding, but it r reflects uh, no uh, diminishment of our interest in this uh, mission area. It is a very important one going forward. And, and I think the, the reference you made to the international agreements recently uh, signed with both Australia and, and France right. is, is uh, evidence of that. Part of our strategy going forward is to do this work uh, more effectively with international partners um, and also uh, commercial and industry partners where, where we can. So part of our emphasis in, in the space community is to, is to recognize that we cannot do all this work alone and to build the necessary partnerships that will support our interests uh, and our pocketbooks uh, going forward. General, are you fine with that answer? Yes, I, I would only add that, that on the space fence side, there was no change. In 2015, the so-called space fence, the, the ground, the surface surveillance capability of space uh, will, will proceed uh, as, as was previously programmed. And in addition, there is an aspect of this that has to do with the Space Operations Center out at Vandenberg and the capacity to understand the potential for collisions and so on and so forth and be able to share that both with industry partners as well as uh, appropriate international uh, partners too. Great. Uh, my other question has to do with the industrial base, the space industrial base. Obviously, as a Californian, I'm incredibly interested in that. Um, we continue to tell our people, don't worry about losing jobs in factories, making televisions, because, you know, we're putting more money into education. We're uh, doing the new, new thing. A part of that is, of course, the space industrial base. So my question is, can you talk a little bit about what the plan is for sustaining the space industrial base and making sure that we take full advantage of commercial space industry resources as well because it seems, um, I mean, these things cost quite a bit of money. Um, how do we make that uh, more cost effective and, and really continue to be a leader when it comes to these assets of space? Uh, I think uh, as, as the chief discussed a little bit earlier, we have t sort of two several lines of work underway to focus on this challenge. Uh, we do recognize the importance of this base. Uh, we do recognize the challenges that it, it has faced uh, in the way that um, the, the military and other parts of our government have bought uh, both launch services uh, and satellites. So on the launch side, uh, we've added money to EELV uh, to normalize that program in the out years, uh, focused on trying to stabilize the industrial base and also our costs going forward. So we have worked uh, closely with the National Reconnaissance Office and with NASA uh, based on some work done by the Defense Science Board to identify the minimum number of launches uh, that need to be covered each year. That number is about nine. Uh, and between the Department of Defense, uh, NRO, and NASA, uh, we have coordinated on a memorandum of understanding uh, that will provide for our continuing coordination going forward 
to fund that minimum level. Uh, we need to go work on the cost and the pricing that, that go with that. Uh, but fundamentally, on the launch side, what we have done is to decouple uh, our approach to launches and to payloads. And uh, in, in prior years, we had focused on not buying the, uh, always having the launcher uh, tied to the payload. And so when we had payload delays, the requirements for launchers, as the chief described earlier, went, went up and down wildly. And this perturbated the industrial base and cost us more money. So our approach now is, uh, is to uh, buy the launchers independently, ensure we have a stable base going forward, um, and hold for later decision the timing of when the launchers and the payloads get married up together. That explains sort of the launch side. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, I know that um, you are both aware that the ECSS program is a major part of an important initiative known as the Expeditionary Logistics for the 21st Century, a strategy that is expected to result in a 10 percent cost savings of at least $12 billion when fully fielded over the future year's uh, defense programs for the Air Force. Uh, the program is currently undergoing a critical change report, CCR process, uh, that has extended beyond the original forecasted completion date and certainly is questioning the program's funding. I know that both of you are aware that um, one of the reasons why the program is undergoing a CCR is because it experienced an 18-month delay due to contract protests and an additional nine-month uh, replanning delay, neither of which were caused by the program itself. Um, further delay obviously would result um, in uh, some interruptions in the program. Um, I would like, uh, if you would please, uh, for both of you to comment on the status of the program. I think we certainly have had a significant amount of comment, uh, positive comments that have been made by the pro about the program and what it will accomplish on behalf of the Air Force in the past, and I, I would like to know the status. And then, I, as you gentlemen are aware, I'm the chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Um, and uh, in looking at uh, the budget, I have several questions. I'll give them to you all at once. Um, but with respect to the, to the uh, new bomber, you know, obviously from the perspective of my subcommittee, we're very uh, con uh, curious as to whether or not the first lot of these new bombers will be nuclear capable and nuclear certified. Uh, with respect to the issue of dual capable aircraft, does the uh, FY12 request contain funding to make the Joint Strike Fighter nuclear capable? And uh, with respect to ICBMs, does the FY12 request contain funding for an ICBM follow-on study? And then with respect to cruise missiles, uh, does the FY12 request contain funding for a follow-on air-launched cruise missile, and will it be nuclear capable? Gentlemen? Sir, why don't you let me give that a try, and then you can fill in the, the blanks. Sir, on... Uh, on the Expeditionary Combat Support System. It, it is an enterprise resource planning system. It's an ERP. Uh, and it's an important one. It, it is something that all of you here who understand big business know that, that to, to really be able to, to monitor the numbers, you've got to have a system like this. But they are hard. They are difficult to, to implement, and they're difficult to field, and they are not cheap. And, you know, we, we have struggled a bit to, to try to get this up and running. We have now two modules which are running. One has to do with um, uh, transportation and vehicle uh, uh, management. The, the second one has to do with inventory management at the installation level. The third one is, the, is a harder one that has to do with supply chain management. Um, and so we have looked at this extensively, and, and it's our view that, that this is something as hard as it is that, that we have got to stick with. Um, and, and, and so you'll be hearing that from the department, I think, um, that, that we, we request the, the Congress's forbearance to, to press on even though our performance to date has, has been lackluster, to be candid. I, I would only mention, in addition, that, that, that this is part of our strategy for achieving a, a capability to be audit ready. 
can't be audit ready if, if, if you can't smash the numbers, and this is one of the vehicles for doing that, sir. Second thing on the bomber, uh, it, it will be nuclear capable. It probably won't be nuclear certified at the outset. Um, F-35, DCA dollars, that's dual capable aircraft dollars, sir, are not in the 12 program. That, that is a, a decision that's further out. It's, it's probably 14 as opposed to 12. Um, on the ICBM, we currently have a mission analysis underway that will lead to a formal um, analysis of alternatives in 13 and that's when it will be funded. And finally, on the outcome, there's about $800 million in the 12 proposal for a follow-on air launch cruise missile. And, and likewise, there's an analysis of alternatives underway that'll conclude in 13. And, and will that follow-on be nuclear capable for the cruise missile air launch? Yeah, clearly, the, the purpose for the follow-on air launch cruise missile is, is a nuclear capability. Excellent. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bordallo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Secretary and uh, General Schwartz. Thank you for appearing today in service for our, to our country. Um, I represent Anderson Air Force Base, one of the finest and most scenic Air Force bases in the country. For just a comment first, gentlemen, um, I remain extremely supportive. <clears throat> of the C-27J program, but I remain deeply concerned about the program cut from 78 aircraft to 38. So I hope that we will continue to examine the lack of rationale for these cuts and work toward ensuring that we have a truly functional tactical air, airlift capability. Now my first question is for either witness. As you know, the Navy signed the record of decision on the Guam military buildup back in September of last year. As the department continues its planning with regards to land acquisition, I remain skeptical that deals can be reached on Guam without significant changes to the Navy's plans. Further, the footprint of the Marines on the east coast of Guam to accommodate firing ranges is inconsistent with local land use. A contigu contiguous Marine base is not likely attainable, and the land issues involved in achieving a, a base are daunting. So as such, to what extent is the Air Force working with the Guam Oversight Council and the Department of the Navy to utilize some of Anderson Air Force Base for marine basing requirements? What type of challenges or impacts should the committee be aware of if some Marines are in the main cantonment area and some are on Anderson? In fact, uh, Congresswoman, uh, they will be on Anderson. Uh, on the west side, Marine Aviation will have its own um, area that, that, uh, that they will use. Um, at the same time, however, I, I think it's important to recognize, and, and I know you appreciate this, that Anderson is a strategic location, and that what, what we need to do is, is not think about trying to dense pack Anderson, but rather we also need to consider what likely contingencies might unfold and what might have to fall in on Anderson in the event of such a contingency. So we want to make as much of Anderson available as is prudent, but not so much that we constrain future contingency operations. This, this is the tension. I understand. And, and something that we do need to keep in mind. Uh, with respect to the... Uh, the, the con contigu contiguous nature of, uh, of, of the Marines and so on. Again, our approach has been to be as supportive as, as possible. Um, and, and what we have asked the Navy and the, the, the OSD folks that are working this problem is to consider all the federal properties, not new property, but existing federal properties for for potential bed down locations for the for the Marine Corps presence. Very good. Thank you, General. My second question is for either the Secretary or the General. Can you update this committee on the progress of filling Air National Guard units with missions, particularly flying missions, that were lost as a result of BRAC 2005 decisions? What's the progress on this issue? I remain concerned that there are still Air Guard units with bridge missions and that we continue to hemorrhage flying capabilities out of these units. 
and I hope you can continue to work with me on a flying mission for Guam. We are missing a key capability out there. Well, we continue to work uh, those issues location by location. Uh, the simple fact is that many of the units that have been in the fighter business over the years, the fighter force structure has been shrinking over time. So uh, we're looking at alternative missions going forward. We've used uh, the uh, uh, MC-12s to work through those issues. We've used the uh, C-27s to work through those issues, the MQ-1, MQ-9 bed down issues. Mm -hmm. uh, all have been part of our considerations as, as we take, where, where we do have new capability and new resources coming into our force structure, but the one-for-one -one replacement models are, are simply not feasible going forward uh, anymore. So we're, we're having to, uh, as we shed legacy aircraft or missions, we have to bring in the new capability and find homes for those, and we certainly uh, want the Guard and Reserve to be part of that work. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have further questions, but I'd like to ha have them entered into the record, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Dr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, uh, welcome today. Thank you for coming. Uh, Secretary Donnelly, uh, General Swartz. Uh, thank you for your service to our country. Um, first of all, I want to uh, uh, comment or just thank you for the fact that we are moving forward now finally on the uh, new generation penetrating bomber. It's good to see that uh, finally up and going. Uh, but I am concerned about uh, some long range issues and, and certainly in terms of our nuclear strength. Um, while our nuclear enterprise uh, strength today is strong, there's one area of concern that I have, and that has to do with the weapons storage area. Uh, as you know, following a very, very serious instance, instances in 2006 and 2007 involving nuclear weapons and, uh, and key components, the Air Force embarked on a top-down review of the nuclear emission. And a number of investigations and reports explored the root causes and led to the uh, that led to the atrophy and decline in the nuclear enterprise. One of the common conclusions is those reports, of those reports was the negative impact on nuclear readiness that resulted from the closure of the Barksdale WSA in 2007. With respect to that decision, let me paraphrase from Dr. Schlesinger's report. The closure of the weapons storage area at Barksdale was, significant, was a significant mistake with a negative operational impact. It created the requirement for bombers to train and exercise from their home station, uh, far from their home station, resulting in operational complications. Nuclear munitions training and proficiency were severely impacted owing to the inability of training weapons to stimulate the real thing, to simulate the real thing. Only from a global nuclear deterrence perspective do the ramifications of this become clear. The task force strongly encourages the Air Force to revisit the Barksdale WSA closure decision. Uh, we arrived at that decision in 2008 to recertify the Barksdale WSA. Uh, and that was part of the Air Force's uh, nuclear roadmap, which included the establishment of Global Strike Command, which of course since has been stood up at Barksdale, and an Air Force uh, directorate to coordinate nuclear issues and the Air Force went as far as requesting $73 million in funding for the project in the FY10 budget request. However, the project has not moved forward, and I do not see any funding for it in this year's budget. And just to encapsulate, the nuclear weapons are at Minot, I'm, yes, are at Minot. Many of the nuclear bombers are at Barksdale, and a potential adversary know this. And the whole idea was not to centralize all of our weapons, of course, in one WSA in Minot, and to at least put some uh, at Barksdale. Uh, so my question is, uh, first of all, for General Swartz, does the Air Force still intend to move forward with this project? No, sir, we don't. And it is true that the initial assessment um, in the 2008 time frame was that was the right thing to do, but when when we ultimately discovered that, that it was a multi-hundred million dollar undertaking mm. to make that come true, 
given the other demands to, to deliver the precision and reliability throughout the enterprise, we decided that that was, that was not sustainable. Um, and, and I acknowledge Dr. Schlesinger's view, and we have talked to him about that then and since. Yes. Um, but the evidence that, that we have collected to this point in time through evaluations, inspections, and so on, uh, I don't deny that the optimal solution would be to have two WSAs. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the reality is, is that, that we had other more pressing matters to attend to, reliability on the aircraft, reliability on the missile systems, and so on, that, that required investment that outprioritized the WSA. Right. Uh, do we, sir, have any uh, mitigating uh, concepts, anything else that might uh, obviously uh, solve that problem for us? I, we think we have. We have implemented that, as you're aware. We, we move the airplanes and the crews from, from Barksdale to, to Minot on a regular basis. Uh, they, have act, they have access to actuals, but of course at home at Barksdale they have access to um, trainers. Uh, and so the bottom line is that, that uh, we think that, and, and so far the evidence we have collected in terms of observing proficiency, professionalism, and so on, is that, that the current solution is workable. Uh, if, if I could quickly ask, is that a final decision or is it possible this could be opened up in the future? I, I would say that, you know, in this business, no decision is, is really ever final, but, yeah. but it would require Jim Kowalski uh, and Global Strike Command to, to come to the conclusion that, that this was essential for them to maintain the, the, the level of proficiency mm -hmm. that's required, and, and that has not yet occurred, sir. I see. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary and uh, General, for uh, joining us here today. First, on behalf of my constituents, I want to express my gratitude for the hard work, courage, and sacrifice of the men and women of the Air Force. These aren't easy times for those who serve, and on behalf of Georgia's 4th District, I thank you all uh, for your service. I'd like to focus for a moment on Air Force procurement because dysfunction in this area is of serious uh, concern. Secretary Donnelly, there, are, there were 12 years between the launch of Sputnik, Sputnik and the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon. It's taken nearly that long to develop and procure a new tanker for the Air Force and on the spectrum of programs that, uh, that the Air Force is developing, uh, the KCX is one of the least technically challenging. Respectfully, I think our collective inability to develop new military systems in a timely manner is a national embarrassment and a huge strategic weakness. We on this committee bear responsibility for that and uh, but so does leadership at the Pentagon. Uh, Secretary Donnelly, why has KCX development uh, and selection taken so long, and when do you foresee that we will finally able, be able to deploy? Well, as uh, you alluded to, sir, the current KCX uh, source selection is actually the third attempt of the Air Force in about the last uh, nine years or so. Uh, and the first were marred by uh, irregularities uh, that caused them to be uh, thrown out, essentially. Uh, so we're, but we, we think we're back on track. Uh, we've worked very hard uh, to focus on uh, strengthening our acquisition workforce and and putting the right KCX team together for us has been uh, the acid test from the very beginning. Uh, in bringing back the tanker program from the last uh, GAO protest, was, which was sustained in 2008 and caused us to go back to the drawing board, uh, we've worked very carefully inside the Air Force acquisition system and with our colleagues in OSD to put together the right team of people 
uh, with the right experience uh, and uh, uh, gravitas uh, to oversee this very important program. It is, it is an important program to us. The average age of the tankers, as you suggested, is about 48, 49 years old. Uh, and that explains why it is our highest acquisition priority uh, at this point in time. I would say uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more on the challenge of, to our acquisition system at a strategic level of, of taking so long and having to pay so much for the new systems that we buy. Uh, there is no doubt that what we are procuring across the board in our Air Force uh, represents uh, significant increases in capability uh, for our Air Force and will stand us in very good stead going forward. Uh, but sometimes the costs, uh, the prices we pay for that are, are certainly more than we would like. And, and the increases in cost uh, combined with the length of time that it takes works us into a spiral where it takes longer and longer to get these new systems field. And I do agree with you that this is a strategic problem for the United States. In the case of the tanker and several other of the programs that uh, were referenced today, the bomber programs, for example, those, those programs, like the KC-135, were built in numbers 30, 40 years ago when the United States spent 8% of gross national product on defense. And we are, while we do not need to build as many as we had in the 50s and 60s, uh, we're now trying to recapitalize those forces on a much smaller uh, base of, of the nation's uh, economic uh, strength. So we're more, more in the neighborhood of 4% of GDP uh, instead of 8% of GDP. So these programs are getting spread out and, and taking much longer uh, than we would like. Okay, point, point well taken. Uh, question to uh, General Schwartz. Uh, is less than 200 F-22s enough to ensure U.S. air superiority for the next three decades? Sir, the the short answer is we, at the time, uh, made a case for somewhat more than 187 aircraft, but that decision's behind us. We now need to move on. We need to get the F-35 into the fleet, um, and 187 F-22s, provided we do the improvements that are in the program, the F-22 Improvement Program is probably one of the six or seven largest procurement efforts we have underway. That's to bring it up to, uh, to, to weaponize it the way it needs to be weaponized and, and improvements for reliability and maintainability and so on. Um, bottom line is it's, it's a smaller fleet than we would like to have had. That's behind us. The, the object now is to make sure that the airplanes we have can kick ass and that we can keep them in the air. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Secretary and uh, General Swartz. Thanks so much uh, uh, for your service to our country. Um, first of all, uh, General Swartz and Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you so much for um, achieving some cost efficiencies through consolidating commands. I, I think it's a, a great initiative on your part. And I, and I want to ask you what further opportunities you see uh, in terms of, of streamlining the, the, the top uh, of the United States Air Force uh, through consolidating commands or, or efforts uh, to, to bring down cost. There are a couple, in addition to the Air Operations Center, that effort that we talked about earlier, you know, we asked ourselves, for example, when you have two headquarters at the same location, you have to ask yourself if that makes sense in the current environment. I mean, there were reasons for it, having the focus and so on. Uh, you know, one headquarters does management stuff, the other headquarters does operational stuff. But, but we came to the conclusion that that was no longer sustainable. So in the case of Third Air Force, for example, at Ramstein in Germany, where we have a major command headquarters, 
the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, we're going to collapse that. The same thing is true at Hickam, where we have 13th Air Force and and, uh, and Pacific Air Forces at the same location is going to do that. And in San Antonio, where we have the Air Education and Training Command and 19th Air Force, we're going to collapse that. And so, the you, you know, this wasn't really a, a stroke of, br of brilliance. I mean, this was just recognizing that, that, that what was once a good idea was probably no longer affordable. And importantly, it was probably less a function of dollars than it was about how precious manpower is right now. And we needed to free up uniform manpower to do the missions that are most pressing, like the 4,500 folks we put into intelligence, surveillance, or reconnaissance, or 2,000 people into, into nuke, or, or 1,000 into aircraft maintenance, that sort of thing. Thank you, General Schwartz. Mr. Secretary, any additional comments to that? Well, uh, just to add that uh, sometimes the opportunities are available on the business side as well. So another area of significant efficiencies for us is in the IT world, uh, where there's uh, significant coordination going on across the services uh, to collapse the number of data centers that we have operating across the department and, and to get, uh, get more efficient in the way we share uh, IT resources and, and conduct our business in that manner. Thank you. The um, unmanned aer aerial vehicles, we we're across the board in all of our branches of the military, we're becoming more and more reliant upon those platforms to do, you know, everything from, you know, uh, tactical strikes uh, to ISR. Now, the, but it, it, the development's fairly fragmented. And, and I know there's been efforts in the past for the United States Air Force to take the lead in this issue. Can you tell me um, if the United States Air Force did have the lead um, on UAVs, um, what kind of potential savings might there be uh, in terms of the development of these platforms? Sir, I don't think it would necessarily be substantial. And, and I have to tell you that this, that this is an, a, a, uh, an emotional issue that I, I just don't know if it's worth it to, to go down this path. What Gary Roughhead and I from the Navy are doing, I think, is representative of what, you know, adults working together can achieve. Uh, he has BAMS, which is a version of our Global Hawk. And the question we asked each other is, why should we have two different depots for these airplanes? Right. Why should we have two different training uh, uh, engines for these birds? Or for that matter, why base them at different locations? And, and we've come together to do that ourselves without the Air Force asserting its dominion over, over remotely piloted aircraft across the department. I, I frankly think that's a better strategy to do this, and, and certainly the budget the challenges we face are, are motivating us to do this. Well, I think you mentioned uh, satellites um, that you know, that you're, um, that you're working across uh, jurisdictional lines, uh, across, uh, you know, branches of the service and other governmental agencies in terms of the development of the satellites, and that, that's leading to a savings. It would, it would seem to be, to me, that if we could derive a savings on the development of these satellites, we could also derive a savings on, the, on a, a better coordination uh, with the development of UAVs in one service taking the lead on it. I, I think better coordination is required. You're absolutely right on that, sir. And, and we're, we're endeavoring, particularly between the Navy and the Air Force, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, just one last question. Um, for the record, uh, if you could update us on uh, those states that aren't um, uh, on the F-16s, for those states that have F-16s for their Air Guard, and where the process is uh, for on the F-35, uh, obviously, specifically in my case, to Colorado. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, running around here today. Uh, and uh, certainly, Mr. Secretary and General, good to have you here. And uh, thank you so much for your service. I wanted to ask you about end strength and the fact that we're obviously pleased that you do such a great job in re recruitment and retention. 
but that creates some real management problems for you. Could you talk to, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit more about that? And I think there was a concern that while you're looking to have both voluntary and non-voluntary um, uh, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Separations, right? In centers. Uh, yes. <laughs> a nice way of putting it in some ways. Uh, but separations at the same time in the FY12 budget, you're looking to increase by 600. Why, why that kind of discrepancy? Uh, just, just quickly on the 600, uh, the, the increase in active duty in strength by 600 was driven <laughs> by the results of the Authorization Act last year, which denied the department's request to convert uh, officers associated with the defense health pr uh, program from military to civilian. That was our, we requested to do that. Uh, Congress uh, denied us that, so we reverted them back to uniformed slots. So that's the reason for that change. Uh, what you've alluded to in, in, in uh, more, more broadly um, is our current and most immediate personnel challenge in the Air Force, which is that uh, given the state of the economy, uh, airmen are not leaving the Air Force uh, at normal rates of attrition, and so we are operating above our authorized end strength, uh, particularly for officers. We s recognized this problem last year, uh, and we did take action, both voluntary and involuntary, uh, to get ahead of this uh, problem, but we did not make enough progress. We made only enough progress really to tread water and the problem has gotten even more difficult this year. So uh, we do have force management uh, actions planned for uh, later this year and into uh, FY12 uh, that will uh, get our end strength down to the authorized uh, levels. Chief, do you want to? I would just comment that, uh, you know, that this is painful. I mean, here we are in the middle of the war and we're, we're trying to encourage people to move on, but we have to do it. We, we, we cannot operate above our, our end strength given the other pressures that we have because obviously we have to take resources from elsewhere to, to make that work. So I think the, the key thing here, ma'am, is that we are asking for author certain authorities which, which go back to the case of the 90s when, when we had a similar situation and, and the Congress gave us temporarily certain authorities that, that uh, enabled us to better manage this, the reductions that we seek to achieve. And, and again, we would do this with compassion and with precision, but we need to do it. How, how do you work with families through this then? Is it different from other transitions or that uh, families go through? I, I think it, it's similar. Uh, you know, we have transition assistance programs. Uh, clearly, it's more difficult, though, if someone leaves voluntarily, the psychology is completely different than when we, we ask someone to leave involuntarily. And so, th you know, the important thing we're trying to do is, is indicate as difficult as this is, and it was a tough decision for the Secretary to take, um, that, that this is for the future of our Air Force, and, and we need you to move on, and we'll do all we can to make it as soft a landing as possible, mm -hmm. but, but that we have to do it. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, if I may just add for a moment, with respect to the additional authorities that we need, uh, we're still working with the Office of the Secretary of Defense to put together that package. We're hopeful that that will get over here to the Congress soon. Understanding uh, the, the normal legislative cycle, we have flagged this as something that we would like to ask your consideration of early and to identify a legislative vehicle uh, against which we can uh, tag this, these authorities early in the year. Hopeful that perhaps we could get the authorities in place before mid-year as we start uh, making, uh, going into boards and such later this uh, summer. If, not, if we do not miss, if, if we do not get the authorities this year, we'll miss a cycle. We'll, we'll pick it up next year, but it would be better if we had it earlier. Okay, and you're saying this is the ma majority of, of, um, 
uh, of people are officers um, that are in the services and not in specialty positions then, you, because you've, you've had special authority to, to recruit us. We are we're being careful about limiting um, or, or sort of protecting certain categories of officers. For example, um, we are protecting certain nurse specialties because they're, they're in very short supply and they're essential. But we're, we're, protect, we're protecting Catholic chaplains for the same reason. But it's very few because we, we're, we're serious about trying to get this behind us. Thank you very much. Mr. Scott. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair, Mr. Secretary General. Um, it, it, as I've traveled, um, and looked at the bases and, and listened, um, whether it's the Air Force or another agency, and talked about the procurement process and running bases, EPA, OSHA, disgruntled bidders. It, it, is there any way to calculate the cost of these burdens on our operational capabilities as a, as a country in protecting our citizens? Well. Uh Mr. Scott, certainly we could try to put an estimate together of, of that. Uh, we, it is the policy of our Air Force to be environmentally responsible and to provide safe and healthy working conditions for our employees. So we want to understand uh, how well we're doing on that and we need to monitor that inside our Air Force. Um, but I don't think I've seen any estimates on the overall cost of that across our Air Force, but we could see if we can get you some more information on that front. Well, don't, don't spend a bunch of money. <laughs> the, 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 the tanker's more important right now. Uh, I'd like to move, General, if I could, to the uh, airlift cap capabilities of the Air Force long term with the uh, no more purchases of the C-17. Uh, what? What effect does that have on our capabilities going forward as much as we're flying the plane? Um, I, I, had, I think we collectively, I certainly have this view, came to the conclusion that, that the 224th C-17 wasn't as much, it wasn't as valued as the first KCX was going to be. That is sort of the situation we're in, and, and it's a question of marginal value to the to, to defense overall, and so I, I I think where we are with a mix of C-17s, 223, 222 of them, and and the remainder uh, C-5s, some of which will be re-engined, some of which currently are not, uh, satisfies the peak demand that we forecast for a, a, a crisis power projection scenario. Um, I think that's, that is a moderate risk force for us and it allows us to devote the resources to procuring the new tanker that we need at 15 a year. Yes, sir. What, um, if I could, move, moving to the Middle East, how close is our relationship, uh, Air Force to Air, Air Force with Israel? Very close, sir. If, is, is there any room for improvement there, or is that something where we work hand in hand day, I, I, day by day? I, I, you'll have to ask Ido Nehushtan uh, what he thinks, but I, I believe that he and I as individuals and certainly as two Air Forces are very close together. We share um, our secrets, frankly, uh, you know, our, our tactics and techniques and so on and so forth. Um, consistent with policy and and I think that that Ido would tell you that we are his best partner. General and Mr. Secretary, uh, we'd love to have you at uh, Warner Robins, Robins Air Force Base as uh, my guest and the people's guest down there uh, in short order and with that I'll yield the rest of my time, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just mention the tanker and leave it at that. I don't know that, I'm not sure I need to say anything more. Uh, where am I from? Thank you. Um, page 12 of your testimony discusses electronic warfare as well, but that's something else I'm obviously very interested in. On the C-130 to, to compass call aircraft conversion, is that 
Would, will that result in these, in these new, new compass call, these converted C-130s, being strictly compass call mission, or will these be on call for a compass call? How, how, how do you envision that? The, the, the conversion of the additional compass call airplane will be a dedicated asset. It will be a dedicated it'll asset. It will be a dedicated asset. And th these will be um, uh, active Air Force assets? Not, not, uh, not reserve, not National Guard. That's, that's correct. Now, there may, you know, one of the things under consideration is having an associate relationship, but that's not yet final by any means. So, initially, that, that converted aircraft will be active duty. Yeah, okay. And then Mald and, oh, good. Yeah, Mald and Mald J are in production? Mald and Mald J certainly are in the program. Mald. Uh, it, the mauled version is, is in production. J will come along here. It is fully funded okay. because it is one of those aspects of our electronic attack effort that, that goes along with the long-range strike family okay. of systems. Right, sure. And increment two, is there, wh what's the timeline for that? Sir, I'll take that for the record great. with your permission. Yep, that's great. On page 20, you talk about your regional partnerships. Uh, I had a chance to be out in uh, uh, Air Force Pacific last May and chance to talk with Admiral Owens about the things they're doing. It's great. Do you have a particular regional focus in your regional partnerships? In fact, uh, one of the things we've done is in our contingency response groups, we have attempted to focus them along combatant command lines. And what that w allows us is to specialize on the language skills, on the sort of cultural awareness and what have you, and, and it's very good. Obviously, the one that's in Europe focuses on, on that area. The one at Anderson in, in the Pacific focuses on, in the, on the Asian uh, region, but the, and the CONUS one split. But I think that uh, clearly this is, this is an area where we are committed as you know, in, in the budget, we have a proposal for a light lift platform, right. a new start in 12 with, with, with the Congress's consent on a light strike platform. But fundamentally, this is about enabling other air forces that are not as sophisticated as ours or, or our near, near peers to build their capacity uh, to, to defend their own airspace. So will, will, the, will the light lift and, and, and light strike be strictly for partners? That is our proposal, sir. Yeah. It, would, it would be for training our air advisors, mm -hmm. and it would be for introducing a less complex, a more, a, a, a more readily assimilated platform into mm -hmm. Uh, these partner air forces that can neither afford nor maybe have the, 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 the technical capacity to operate F-16s, for example. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, with regards to uh, EELV, I understand there's a pretty significant increase in, in that over, a lot, over 11 or 10 or whichever budget you're operating under today. Um, we should be taking care of that tonight, I think. Uh, one step closer, but the uh, the effort to uh, by the Air Force to increase access to space by making these launch vehicles more affordable and reliable is important. But um, I have heard concerns from some folks how the Air Force is how is the Air Force ensuring that companies uh, such as SpaceX, which is going to be part of that new industrial base that's out there on satellites, um, as well as there's a, there's other competitors out there too. Um, that are not traditional larger contractor competitors. How are they being given, being given access to contract competition as a way of promoting lower costs for that particular program or any of the satellite programs? Uh, we're working through the issues of uh, what certification will be uh, required for uh, commercial partners to enter the space launch work. So there's more to follow on that. Uh, NASA has had more of the lead in that. They are further right. along. Uh, met with the National Reconnaissance Office the other day on some of these subjects. Uh, we're, we're also uh, tracking NRO and with NASA in, in terms of developing uh, criteria for certification going forward. I just know these folks might be new to this, and so uh, um, I think you need to take that, keep that in mind as well. They are, but uh, you know, we're, we're very focused on mission assurance. Uh, and as I think the chief has mentioned previously, we don't necessarily want to take a $2 billion satellite and put it on 
top of a launcher that is a first time effort for someone. Thanks. That's something I'd want to talk to you about. Uh, you mean first time for the Air Force, not necessarily first time. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Donnelly, General Schwartz, it's great to have you back with us. We appreciate your service to our nation. Secretary Donnelly, let me begin with you. I want to talk a little bit about our ability to, pro to project power, and specifically in light of China's efforts of anti-access. As you know, their efforts there are continuing to emerge, and it concerns me when you look at our alliances and our security partnerships in those regions about our ability to project power into the future, especially in how it affects our ability in areas like the Western Pacific and, and where we're going in the future. Let me ask this. As we look at our ability to project power, I know we have the next generation bomber coming online some years into the future. You do have schedule, though, to retire the B-1, and retiring the B-1 as excessive of requirements. Seems like to me, though, that there is a gap between the retirement of the B-1 and the introduction in a serviceable form of the next generation bomber. Can you elucidate a little bit for us about how we are not going to lose the ability to project force during that period of time as we're retiring the B-1 and as we're bringing the next generation bomber online? Uh, our, our bomber forces are managed very carefully uh, in, inside of our force structure. We recognize the aging challenges, the maintenance challenges that go with the uh, uh, each, each of the platforms, which comes from a completely different generation of, of technology, despite all the upgrades that they've had over the years. Um, we have not made a decision on retiring the B-1. The proposal in FY12 is to reduce the fleet from 66 to 60 aircraft. So it's to reduce the fleet by six aircraft. Uh, there are savings that are harvested from that. Uh, we believe that it's sort of been through the analysis. Uh, the military judgment was that this is not an, uh, an unreasonable burden on operational uh, risk. This is something that we can do. Um, and uh, we also harvested dollars out of that which we could put back into the B-1 uh, for cockpit, upgrading cockpit displays and other uh, maintenance support uh, aspects of this work that will help sustain the platform going forward. I, I have to say this is not an unusual profile uh, in, mo in, in managing inventories of aircraft that over time they tend to shrink a little bit over time and you harvest the dollars to put it back into the long-term sustainability of the remaining fleet. So that reduction of six then is going to be really where the where the movement is going to be. And the remainder is 60. 60, right, gotcha, okay, very good. General Schwartz, let me ask that. I want to go from our bomber aircraft to our fighter aircraft. As we know, um, some challenges there. As you know, with the F-22 program being terminated, also now with the F-35, lagging a little bit time-wise and being able to deliver those platforms to make sure that we can meet that requirement. Also with the retirement of F-15s, F-16s, A-10s, you look at our fighter component and you look at the recent developments in China with the J-20 and you look at our strategic capability as it relates to fighters. My question is this, is does this scenario, does this justify the 124 uh, f 35 reduction in the fit up and I just want to look at that in in context of where we're going especially with concerns across all of our groups of fighters in a perfect world if if the program was was absolutely healthy my answer would be certainly not mm -hmm. but the reality is was is that is that the bottom up review that Admiral Vindlet did on on the F35 you know yielded insights that suggest that that number one, the plant in Fort Worth couldn't produce those airplanes right now, even if we wanted them to. Right. And that there are there are there are issues in terms of development less on our airplane, that is less on the conventional takeoff version than than the Stovall version to be sure. But but the reality is that you know where we are at right now is I think as as aggressive as we can <laughs> pragmatically be okay. uh, until this the, the the program picks up more momentum mm -hmm. and and so we're 
we've got 14 airplanes in flight test. Uh, our, our acquisition of, of assets is 203 over the program period, and that's 57 less than it would have been for the Air Force. As you suggested, it's 124 system-wide. Yeah. Um, I, I think, regrettably, mm -hmm. that, that is, that's the right place for us to be uh, given the level of confidence that we have at the moment. I believe that, that the airplane is going to be the centerpiece of our tactical fleet, mm -hmm. you know, in due course. But, but getting it into full rate production has, has been a greater struggle than, than we imagine. I think this is a time to be a little bit more conservative. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was trying to remember the date that we had that wonderful lunch in Sacramento, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for coming out for Air Force Day and for a terrific show by the Air Force General. You and your uh, men and women did a, a wonderful job displaying the Air Force there in Sacramento when I was Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for that. I now have the joy of and the pleasure of representing Travis Air Force Base. And uh, I want to compliment all the uh, men and women. I won't say, well, otherwise I'd get a chair out of some ex-Travis folks here. I'll just let that go. Um, but they did a terrific job in Haiti and, uh, I don't know, maybe a flight every five minutes or so to uh, the theaters of war. Yeah. It's a lot of hard, but a lot of good work, and we compliment you on that. Uh, we also compliment you on the effort you're making for the community. You really do reach out, and the current effort underway to um, in employ more local contractors is much appreciated. Um, and I also want to compliment you on the, uh, the new Lima program and the uh, studies that are going on and the process you're going through to, to select uh, the appropriate base. I have my favorite. I, I'll let that go for a moment. But uh, it, it sounds like it's going to be a very useful, and it fits into, uh, I guess, your new tactical fighter, which is looks pretty much like a Korean War fighter upgraded significantly. Uh, in any case, my, I really don't have a question other than to uh, compliment you on, on the work that you're doing and the service that you're rendering. Uh, and I, uh, one more thing, because I got three minutes and 25 seconds. I was shocked, delightfully, to hear your opening statement about the missile acquisition programs, that you're actually going to work with the other services, including NASA, for some sort of, let's see if we can make it all work together. I was on the uh, science committee uh, last year, and uh, I don't think NASA was quite willing to do it when they started the hearings. At the end of the hearings, they were more willing to work with you and, and on a common, more common platform and the uh, satellite business. It's the way to go, and I want to compliment you for heading that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Lernberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, in a few minutes, we're going to have another vote on another amendment uh, cutting V-22. I realize this question is better suited for the Marine Corps, but there are five CV-22s in the Air Force budget. Can you make a brief comment as to how that program is going and particularly how the aircraft is performing? As I in indicated earlier, sir, th this, this is a capability we've never had before. It, it, we need to continue that procurement profile to the full 50 that the Air Force Special Operations Command uh, expects to uh, possess. Uh, it, we've had it in Africa. We've had it in Iraq. Uh, it's going to be headed out to Afghanistan shortly. Uh, in fact, it's been in Afghanistan as well. Forgive me. Um, I think the, the, the bottom line is that this is a machine that both the operators and the passengers, very important, uh, you know, like to have in order to execute their missions. Um, I, I, I would certainly say that, that uh, there would be other things I would give up in the Air Force budget before the CV-22. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to your conversation with Mr. Larson about partnerships. Uh, because in addition to the idea that we could have some uh, certain kinds of aircraft to help train other uh, air forces, uh, training is, is a part of that. Uh, in last year's defense bill, we had a provision to make it possible for the aircraft to bring some uh, 
pilots uh, to be trained here with the INJEP program uh, from Eastern European countries. But, 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 in, but in a larger sense, it just seems to me that uh, we are all, all branches of the military are going to have to do more of this training with others. And that, inclu that includes the education and training piece as well as, as, as the equipment piece. Are, are y'all looking, whether it's that or other things, at, at creative ways to help uh, these sorts of opportunities? Because some of these small countries don't have big budgets to, to send to, to, to participate, uh, whether it's to buy aircraft or to send pilots to train here. So it seems to me we are going to have to be a little more creative in sorting through these things because it may be just one pilot from a country, but he may be chief of the staff of the Air Force before long. Sir, that is absolutely true. Just a case in point, the current chief of the Indonesian Air Force was trained here in the United States but he is the last of that genre because there was a, you know, a 12 or 14 year gap uh, after he, he wrapped up his training and he's now the chief. There is no question, but that training we do, whether it be for piloting or infantry officers or, you know, intermediate service school, what have you, is, is playing the long ball. And, and we certainly are committed to, to continuing to do that. I can just give you quickly, you talk about innovations. The contingency response group that I talked about, their primary mission is opening expeditionary airfields. And they've got cops and they've got engineers and they've got docs and air traffic controllers and so on. And what we decided was when they're not opening airfields, they can be training and educating NASA and Air Forces who need to develop these varied skill sets. So they now have this additional mission to grow other Air Forces. I, I think that's a, a, an indication of the innovation we've undertaken. Well, and, and we want to work with you for not only funding, but legal authorities for those sorts of, of creative exercises. Last question, you were talking with personnel about personnel with Ms. Davis. Uh, for some time we have talked about uh, some non-traditional uh, authorities for certain categories of personnel. Cyber is one that's, that's fresh in my mind. Uh, because sometimes the folks you need to uh, run cyber may not fit a traditional military profile. Is, is that something uh, y'all are looking at or, or have suggestions for that we, where we can help you? Sir, you're the expert on this, uh, to be sure, but I... I, I think we do need to be more, a little bit more flexible. Um, for example, there, there are, thanks to the Secretary, there's an effort underway to allow people to go out of the Air Force to, to the Guard for a period of time and, and have the opportunity to come back into the active duty if that fits the way they, you know, their lifestyle is unfolding. I do believe that, that having the additional flexibility on career paths will serve us well in terms of, you know, retaining the kinds of people we need. Right now, it's not an issue. The economy is not, you know, is favorable in terms of retention. But, but when it turns, you know, that's when we'll be competing for the best and brightest. Thank you. Uh, I was happy to hear your comments, uh, General, on the on the B-22. As Mr. Ray said earlier, we uh, flew uh, in uh, Afghanistan on the B-22, and it was a great ride. And I know there were problems early on with the development, but uh, now it's it's a it's a good bird. It is a proven platform, sir. Yeah, uh, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary and General, I represent the Black Knights at Little Rock Air Force Base and uh, would like to talk with you about the C-130 AMP, the avionics uh, modernization program. Um, first, I'd like to ask you, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to make sure, uh, is there any risk to this program, to the AMP program, as a result of the uh, efficiencies that uh, you're implementing? No, sir. We, we, the, the program is designed to do 221 um, H2, H2.5, and H3 category C-130 Hs, and, uh, and that's, that's 
what we're going to do. Now, uh, my understanding, General, is that uh, in, in FY09, there was funding. In FY10, there was not funding. And so right now, uh, currently, it's not funded. And is that, is that correct? That, uh, that's my understanding, and, my underst and I wanted to just, uh, if you don't have those statistics, you may not be able to uh, answer this, but what I'm concerned about is if the CR uh, does not pass, uh, I, I think there will be a funding gap. Uh, I, if, if I remember correctly, there was a, a Nun McCurdy breach uh, a, a couple years ago or whatever. Um, and uh, the funding stopped, and so if we stay where we are, there's no funding. If we get the CR passed, uh, then there is funding. Uh, is that a, a fair characterization of where we are? I, I, we need to confirm this for you, but okay. I believe that to be the case. We did not defund this program right. in the Air Force. I think this is a a CR-related issue, but, sir, we'll, we'll confirm that uh, in writing for you. Uh, that's my understanding. I mean, my understanding is if, if, you, if, you're, if you vote for the CR, then you are voting for uh, funding uh, for the C-130 AMP. And if you vote against it, you're voting to keep things uh, as they are and there's no funding. Uh, uh, if you could check on that and, and get back with me, uh, and I will, I will mention, incidentally, uh, that I am starting uh, the um, C-130 Modernization Caucus. It's very important uh, to me and my district and to our national security. Um, have you done any sort of calculation to look at uh, what the numbers would be, the, the dollar savings would be as a result of the, the efficiencies that we get from uh, the AMP process? Uh, in terms of uh, maintenance cost and, and uh, operational cost uh, savings. So we'll have to get back to you on the details of the business case. But there was a business case done. Um, I, I, one thing I could comment on, though, very importantly, is that, is that the AMP modifications also include subsystems that allow the airplanes to operate in increasingly demanding airspace, European airspace, for example. Uh, in terms that, that require precision navigation and communications, which the basic airplanes do not possess. So we'll, we'll take that one as well for the record, sir, and get you the, the, the rough numbers on the business case for AMP. Okay. Um, if you don't know this, I'd like you to add this to your list. I'd, like, I'd be real interested in what your number is in terms of how many years of combat service you believe that we're adding to these C-130s that go through the AMP process, um, that ultimately relates to efficiencies. And uh, I think those numbers will bear out that the AMP uh, investment is a good investment, uh, and uh, a good investment for our national security and a good investment for the taxpayer, uh, both of which are, are important. Um, I, I appreciate that. I, I was given uh, a couple of questions to ask for a colleague of mine, um, and I, I just wanted to see if you could get to them quickly in my 39 seconds that I have left. Uh, Representative Kinzinger of uh, Illinois wanted me to ask uh, about the uh, flight suit uh, development. Uh, he, he indicated that he had seen the press articles about a uh, hundred million dollar uh, price tag for developing a flight suit, and uh, he was just wondering if you, if that's accurate, and if you have anything to say about that. I think he's a pilot, Air Force pilot himself, so. Uh, we're, we're not in the business of uh, redesigning our flight suit under the current circumstances. Okay, great. I will pass that on to him, and my time has now expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Conaway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was unexpected. Uh, just as an aside, there are at least two of us in the room who understand there's a second Air Force base that uh, Mr. Rogers needs to visit before he makes categorical statements uh, in reference to his. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. I um, want to talk a little bit about, uh, and even General Schwartz mentioned it, in the auditability of the Air Force's financial statements. Um, made the posture statement. Um, skidded in just in ahead of conclusion and strategic basing, page 26 or 27, but nevertheless made the cut. 
I uh, appreciate that. Um, I've had good discussions with um, the team that you've got in place to do this. Um, the Air Force has further to go than the Department of Army, Department of Navy, uh, and so you've got to run a little bit faster. I've got great confidence in uh, his team and, the, the goes, and, and his colleagues over at the Army and the Navy as well, that, that they get it, they understand it. Um, I'm wondering how much um, easier, or excuse me, less difficult finding your 33 billion share of the hundred billion dollar reprogram might have been had you had better systems in place. Uh, and and you, one of my colleagues asked you for how much something cost. Um, and Secretary Donnelly, you mentioned you try to get that number. Somebody in your team just threw up in their bucket thinking they'd have to go through whatever they had to do to make that, get you that number, those kinds of things. So uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your commitment to getting this done uh, sooner maybe rather than later, uh, and in your opinion as to how important good financial systems that you use to run your business. I mean, we've got this hide, but this issue we've been hiding behind in the sense that uh, you're getting a clean audit requires a balance sheet and everything else, and, and that's a way off. But you use day in and day out data systems, financial systems to make decisions. That ought to be auditable uh, sooner rather than later. So can you just give me, give me your, your share what's, side of what's going on? Uh, we do think this is an important uh, priority for the Air Force. Uh, it has been on our plate for a long time, uh, and certainly we are not uh, where we want to be. Uh, but as I think you've been briefed, uh, we are making some progress. Um, as of the end of last year, uh, we have asserted audit readiness in a couple of areas that we think are important. Uh, a hundred percent of uh, appropriations received uh, used in our automated funds management system. This is the system that tracks appropriations from Congress to OMB, to the Department of Defense, to the Department of the Air Force, and to from our headquarters Air Force to our major commands. Uh, we're not all the way down to the field level yet, uh, but we're working on that uh, part of the problem and we think we, uh, we've got 100% auditability in, through the automated funds management system to do that. Uh, that's, not, that's, that's one of many aspects of auditability, uh, but it's an important one. Uh, and it's one that I think Secretary Hale has put emphasis on, and, and I think you're, you're familiar with his uh, uh, focus on making sure that we get uh, the clean financial statements and the auditability on the systems we most often use and rely on. Um, another uh, piece of this has been uh, our, our preparedness to uh, assert audit readiness on about 48 percent of our mission critical equipment, uh, which includes all of our military equipment, our military hardware. Uh, there is more to follow in the other 52 percent in terms of uh, uh, spares and logistics support and and where a lot of numbers are, but uh, those percentages based on dollar exposure had 52 percent of what uh, uh, inventory? I think inventory it's, based I, on dollars. I think it's I think it's inventory. It's it's I think it's assets. I'm not sure that it is uh, uh, dollar based. I think it's asset based. Um, but in, a, in addition to these areas, and the Chief mentioned one in particular early, the ECSS system is our enterprise resource system for a modern logistics system. We must get uh, this done. It is very important to us. It, is, it has been painful, continues to be a challenge, uh, but we think it's worth sticking, uh, sticking with going forward. For uh, with the experience of this committee, and I think for other committees for many years, you recognize the importance of, of getting software right across our weapon system. This is a huge issue as uh, more electronics have gone into our weapon systems. So working through software issues is critical. In our enterprise resource systems like ECSS, software is everything. It's the whole, it's the whole thing. So it's very, very uh, hard work, but again, uh, we're, we're trying to make some progress here. Well, thank you. Just I want to be, be careful that we don't, in our quest to cut spending and find efficiencies, that we don't become penny wise and pound foolish uh, and, and under resource uh, this important effort. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. Thank you, Mr. Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Swartz, Secretary Donnelly, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. And thank you for everything you do for our airmen. Um, 
I have the pleasure to represent the 3rd Congressional District of New Jersey, which as we know is home to Joint Base mcguire dix Lakehurst. And Joint Base is an air mobility center of excellence in extending um, air mobility forces global-wide, moving troops and cargo. But over, over the past 10 years, we have uh, lowered the number of aircraft and the aircraft capability requirement worldwide has grown. And, you know, even the hostility around the, around the world has grown. And, I, and I, quite frankly, General Schwartz, is, as the requirement of the mobility aircraft is lowered, because we, is it because we have less equipment, less people, you know, less missions, or is it just, quite frankly, because of budget? First of all, I'm from Tom's River, so I, I can sure you have family that are constituents. <laughs> the, uh, I, the bottom line is we have better airplanes. Um, you know, I, there was a day when we had C-47s that, you know, we had thousands of them, and, and we now have C-17s and C-5s, and we've got several hundred. Uh, I think, you know, we are making economic decisions here. I mean, you know, you have to be somewhat businesslike here. There are times when it doesn't matter what it costs, but when it comes to sizing the fleet, it does matter. And, uh, and so I think the, the bottom line is we have looked at the most stressing possible contingency, the scenario. We've, we've modeled that. We've come to the conclusion that 32.7 million ton miles a day, that's gross capacity is what the country needs to, to project military power. And that that is met with a combination of C-17 and C-5 aircraft in the low 300s, um, and th and that's the, the the you know the tack that we're on, sir. Um, these are expensive airplanes to operate, but we would not have gotten 6,000 um, MATVs or MRAP vehicles to Afghanistan without them. So, yes, we have capacity. We can do that, and we have. We did the surge in Afghanistan that ended up this summer. And, you know, we mobilized some reserves in order to get that done. But the bottom line is that I think that low 300s of the big airplanes is, is the right number for us. Well, thank you for that. And you know, I, I live close enough there in Burlington County where they're overhead all the time. We see them, so I know you guys are... You guys are uh, busting your tail on thanks. And with that, I, I yield back, Chairman. Thank you. And, and riding along with that, uh, I understand that we have better planes. I remember talking about the B-2, how in uh, previous wars we talked about how many planes it took to take out a target. And now we've talked about how many targets a B-2 can take out. But at some point, numbers also do, do matter. And uh, hopefully we'll be OK. But, it, but when we get down to the last one, there is it, it may not be enough. Mr. Chairman, uh, you, can't, you can't be in two places at once. Right. Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the distinguished panelists being with us here today. And I thank you for your leadership uh, of the Air Force. And I also want to express my support and admiration for all those uh, that serve under your command and to the families. My question has to do with uh, joint forcible entry uh, capabilities. In the next uh, three years or so, three to four years, we'll be wrapping up, successfully wrapping up our operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we'll be refocusing the force. And I'm interested to hear your vision and commitment to providing trained and ready forces uh, as we look towards restoring a capability joint forcible entry for Army Airborne and also for Marine Expeditionary. We take tasking, sir, from, from our joint force commanders. And, and if that's the, the demand signal, that's what we'll do. It's as simple as that. And by the way, you know, the 82nd hasn't been uh, leg bound, so to speak. They, uh, you know, they're maintaining their, their jump credentials, not when they're deployed, to be sure, but certainly when they're back at Bragg. And, and you know, we're providing the platforms for that training. Um, I, I would say that, that there are times when 
joint forcible entry works and there's times when you know it, it is not as simple perhaps as it once was this is the old question about anti access and aerial denial capabilities so we just can't run massive formations of C130s or C17s in in areas that that are too hostile for them to operate but there is a methodology to reduce that threat such that we can enter it at a time and place of our choice. I just, uh, well, sir, if I, I, yeah. just, just to add, there, there are a variety of Air Force capabilities that contribute to that aspect of joint operations. So not, not just the lift, but the intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance that goes with that, the command and control background through, uh, backbone through satellite systems and, and many other dimensions of joint operations where the Air Force is uh, supporting with key capabilities. Well, I appreciate those comments very much. I probably should have uh, said at the outset that I commanded the, uh, the Division Ready Brigade uh, up until last year. And I will tell you that uh, your, your formations down there uh, at Pope uh, really did a fantastic job. They, uh, many of them grew up uh, at a time when that was a higher priority uh, and uh, are really working exceptionally hard to restore that capability in an environment that really puts a lot of demand. And as you point out, not only C-17s, but really this is a fully across the board joint endeavor uh, to, to actually overcome issues of anti-access. So uh, it's an area that's, uh, that I believe we need to work at uh, restoring in the coming years, especially as we reset and conclude operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, uh, I thank you very much for your comments and look forward to working with you uh, on that point. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, just as a point of interest, I met a couple of weeks ago with uh, General Dempsey, and he was uh, commenting that they are changing uh, the training. Uh, I, I was just recently at uh, National Training Center and uh, with, uh, with Mr. Smith and the uh, Marine Mountain Training Center, and then at Lewis McCord, and all of the training there was geared toward Afghanistan, but they're looking out over the horizon and uh, planning in the next uh, round of training in those, in those centers, they're going to start focusing on the training that uh, the Colonel was talking about, and so uh, it, it's good to know that they are thinking out ahead on that. Ms. Hartzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary and General, it's an honor to be here today and to, to have opportunity to visit with you. I am uh, representing the Missouri 4th Congressional District, of course, home of Whiteman Air Force Base, and we're very, very proud of the good work that's being done there and uh, the B-2 bomber. And wanted to ask a little bit of questions about the new bomber that's being uh, developed. Uh, I see this year in the budget request we got 197 uh, million dollars for RDT and E. I was just wondering, what's the time frame uh, for this new bomber to be able to come online? Mid 2020s. Okay, I was just wondering, is it projected to replace the B2 bomber eventually, or no? No, I, uh, the B2 will be part of our inventory uh, for as far as we can see forward right now. That's good news. That's good news. Have you determined where the, the new bomber will be housed yet? Would that be down the road? No, down. that's a down-the-road decision, ma'am. Okay, very very good. Uh, also wanted to ask some questions about uh, the new tanker, uh, the KCX. Uh, of course, we have one in ten Americans out of work right now, and jobs are very important uh, to all of us. I know to the, to the president, he says we want to hire, uh, we need to hire more workers. Yet, from what I understand, the, the competition for the tankers between an American company and a European company. Um, and so I was just wondering why, when we need more work here in America, would the administration be talking about uh, outsourcing some of our very important um, military uh, equipment to a foreign government? The, the uh, acquisition process that we're using t for the source selection on the KCX is one that is governed by statutes which the Congress has created and is open to qualified bidders. So uh, uh, EADS is a qualified bidder um, and has been 
a partner in other work uh, in our na uh, across our national security or aerospace establishment. So. So in the current statutes now, there's not a, a preference or for American companies over other companies so worldwide? Uh, only in some very, very specialized uh, areas, uh, specialty metals and these sorts of areas. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's interesting to, to know and uh, appreciate your responses and all the good work that you do. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back my time. Thank you, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Secretary Donnelly, and uh, General Schwartz, thank you very much for uh, your testimony today and, and for the work that you're doing uh, to keep our nation safe. Um, as the, the ranking member uh, of the Emerging Threat Subcommittee and the former uh, chair of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, I've been um, very concerned about uh, the potential uh, for a cyber attack on the, on the national electric grid, among uh, many other things. but. Uh, that in particular, and the impact, of course, on our ability uh, to conduct our strategic military missions. During the, uh, the last Congress, um, I asked uh, uh, Major General Weber, uh, Commander of 24th Air Force in charge of cyber operations, what measures were being taken to mitigate the risk uh, to military bases in particular uh, that rely on civilian power sources in the, uh, the event of a cyber attack against these, these systems. As you know, uh, many of our, our military bases uh, are required, uh, are, are dependent on uh, the, the electric um, uh, grid uh, that are primarily in the, in the hands of uh, the private sector and uh, the owner, er, owners and operators are in the, uh, obviously in the private sector. Uh, I was pleased that, um, to hear that uh, the general responded that the Air Force had been actively engaged uh, in looking into these issues. So my questions are, uh, how much progress has been made in, in evaluating threats to our military bases that rely on single sources of civilian power systems? Uh, it's number one. Uh, next, uh, has the Air Force strengthened plans for uh, energy security by examining uh, new technologies that could lead to better alternative energy sources? And uh, number three, and finally, uh, are you uh, confident the Air Force could carry out uh, prolonged strategic level missions over a significant length of time in the event of a massive uh, commercial electric grid uh, failure? So, uh, and as you know, uh, Idaho National Labs uh, a couple years back uh, had found a uh, significant vulnerability to, uh, to our electric grid whereby a skater attack could potentially uh, take down a, uh, a power plant and potentially uh, damage a sector of the electric grid for quite some time. And if our military bases are dependent on that grid, uh, it could be a, a significant challenge for us. So I'd like to ask you to address those questions. Um, a big set of issues, um, very important ones. Critical infrastructure protection across the board is a, a priority for the Department of Defense and, and certainly for the Air Force as well. The local analysis, uh, the, the analysis that is there is often localized. It depends on uh, a base's local situation, its relationship with the community and the local power grid at that location. Uh, and so it varies from location to location. Uh, but we're very interested in I identifying uh, single points of vulnerability uh, and taking actions to mitigate that. We store fuel, we have uh, all backup generators in place, uh, for example, in many, many locations uh, uh, so that we can operate if and when power uh, goes down. Uh, so this is, some of this is sort of standard work, uh, but we understand the importance of getting a more strategic perspective uh, on this, and uh, it, it, it is uh, going to be a challenge, I think, uh, and I, I think we're kind of still at the front end of a lot of this work, but as the General Schwartz would want to fill in a little bit. Sure. I, I, I think that the key thing here is, as you know, we identify mission essential facilities, and, and we posture those with backup power, either uh, ups or, or generators and, and so on. Uh, they're not foolproof. Sometimes the power goes down, they don't turn on. We had a, a situation develop, in fact, recently, I think it was at March in, uh, in San Bernardino where, where they were controlling a couple of orbits of, of uh, predators and the, the commercial power went down and, and the backup didn't kick in right away. So it's not foolproof, but we do know where our key, our key missions are and, and what those things are that, 
that uh, you know can't afford an interruption, and, and we try to back that up. With respect to your question on on innovation, uh, I, you know I think we're really open to about anything. I mean, Nellis Air Force Base, you visited, I know. You know the the solar array there is 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 in the top five in the world. It, it, it powers about a quarter of the base energy consumption, and we're going to expand that. Um, wind has a place. We're we're looking hard at that as well. Uh, so we're we're looking at ways again to be to diversify our sources of power for exactly the risk management reasons you you indicate. Thank you. My time's expired, but I, I'll have additional questions for the record. But in the meantime, uh, thank you very much for your your service, and uh, I look forward to uh, having you before us again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Probably what we should do is build uh, one of those, you know, we have all those nuclear-powered uh, carriers and submarines. Just, just build some of those plants and put them on every base, and we could really move, uh, we could really move forward in energy independence. Well, it's funny you should say that, Mr. Chairman, because uh, uh, an electric boat in uh, uh, Groton, Connecticut, because uh, we have a presence in in, uh, in my district, in uh, uh, Quonset Davisville, but that was we built the finest uh, nuclear submarines in the world, starting in my district. And I know that uh, General Dynamics is actually looking at uh, producing uh, domestic, uh, smaller uh, reactors for perhaps just that purpose, maybe someday uh, it'll be viable. They've, they've definitely proved their safety. Um, Mr. Smith, do you have anything further? Uh, let me just make one, one closing. Uh, uh, request. We had um, in a in a plant 42 in my district. We had 175 positions that were slated for conversion. Of that number, 61 were firefighters. I met with many of those many of those gentlemen. 44 lost their jobs just because they were too old, and they're a lot younger than I am. Um, 17 of the uh, 61 were rehired. The readiness subcommittee sent you a letter, you responded. We asked for um, a cost analysis, we got it, but it was about a document that thick. Is there a way that maybe you could break out how that was handled at, at plant 42? And uh, I understand it's too late to save those jobs, that was taken care of in January of, of uh, this year. You did um, not use your authority to waive that limit. I would like to readdress that later, which we will in the, in the next bill. But uh, thank you for that. Uh, with that, this uh, hearing, thank you for being here for your uh, good response and any of the questions that were asked for on the record, if you could respond on those and we'll continue to work together now as we go through this process. Thank you and this hearing is adjourned.